Hey guys, welcome back. Um, we are going to be getting into SketchUp now. So, um, we're going to be going right from the top here. I'm assuming you guys have already gotten into SketchUp, but if you haven't, um, don't forget to check out the um, software guide on the Canvas uh, that will give you guys more information about how to get access to SketchUp. Um, as an aside, I would always recommend and will always recommend buying the license for this because unlike the student editions of all the other programs, um, you really want the standalone version of this. Um, it is $55 for a year, which is much cheaper than the $13.50 or whatever it was uh, when I was a student. So highly recommend it. It's cheaper than a book and it's a full year license. So um, <clears throat> from here, um, typically I would recommend you guys use this first template right here, uh, the simple one. You can also use the architectural. I recommend sticking in those because, again, they are in standard or inches. Um, some of these other ones here are typically too small. Um, we aren't going to need, for example, well, we're not going to do millimeters. We're not going to do centimeters or meters. Um, there are some templates that also have the default unit as a foot. I won't get into the software engineering reasons of why that is something you want to avoid. But, um, yeah, for this, um, just the inches template is fine. Simple architectural, I prefer simple, mostly because the sky is prettier. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just click on this, and we'll get into the program itself. All right, it took a minute. So um, here I am in the SketchUp interface. Let's talk about movement first. So the first thing you're going to want to do is rotate. And in SketchUp to rotate, you're going to hold down the middle mouse button, and you can move around like this. That is the same as turning on this control right here, which is Orbit, or you can hit the O key on the keyboard to pull that tool out. Um, what I'm going to do a lot in this program is hit Spacebar, and that'll get me back to the uh, Select tool right here. So um, if you just, again, if you just use the tool on the mouse, it automatically, as you press the tool down, switches you to Orbit, and then as soon as you take the tool off, it goes back to the uh, arrow for Select. So that's why it's really nice using the mouse tool for some of this stuff. Um, the next thing is going to be um, just zooming in and out. You can zoom out right there with the mouse wheel. Um, like the other programs, it does it relative based on what, where the mouse is. So if I zoom in on one area and zoom out on another, I can move around in small gaps like that. Um, and then the one tool that I wish there was a way to bind it, well, or I wish it was naturally just bound somewhere else, is the pan tool. Um, that's going to be this hand right here and you can press H to pull the tool out, and that'll just let you move side to side up to down based on your current relative position. Um, with this tool out, I can very quickly just kind of move around and do different things. Um, one thing I would point out is SketchUp does rotations and things based on the center. So if I have this person here in the center clicked, I can usually rotate fairly close around them, whereas if I am way out here, no, it's got me centered back in there now. Um, but it can do some weird stuff. So I usually recommend you guys like find something and then select that and start a rotation That can help it kind of keep things um, within a certain distance One other thing I'd like to show you guys is if I go really far out here, you can see I'm super far out from there um, If you go to view or sorry uh, camera different program um, and then do zoom extents or control shift E that will get you back to what you were basically the zoom extents. It works just like the one in uh, AutoCAD. So if you get kind of far lost, and more frequently what's going to happen is you'll be working inside of a room, you'll get yourself caught in a wall, and instead of sitting there for like three minutes, like I promise you guys will run into this. You'll be sitting there rolling the mouse wheel back for like a minute and finally get out. Just control shift E, oops, and you can jump right back out. Um, so there is a zoom tool, but again, it just, I'm clicking down, but I could just use a mouse wheel for that. Um, it also does, um, is this zoom extends? Yeah, they just move them around and stuff. So, um, anyway, let's get started on the interface here. So we have all these tools up here. Um, one thing I would recommend is clicking on window. Default tray, actually, no, we're going to leave the trays alone for now. We need toolbars under view 
And then I like having this large tool set and it gives me this menu bar over here, but it also gives me a couple different options that aren't on here, like this, uh, these like placement things for different things. Um, it also gives me some of the extra options for uh, like section play. Uh, but most importantly, it gives you this tool right here, the follow me tool, which um, otherwise is under tools and then follow me. Um, we'll be going over how to use those tools in the next video or, well, yeah, we'll probably, probably actually just do one long video for this. Um, yeah. So um, let's start at the top here. Um, we have the eraser. You can turn that on by hitting E. Um, and I can erase that person that's there just by doing that. Um, Along with the select tool, you can do a left to right select. So I can select that direction or I can select that direction. Just like with AutoCAD, if you do it left to right, it's only gonna select things that it fully encircles. So if I only go right there, it's only gonna get that portion. I have to go all the way around. Whereas if I do a right to left select, it's gonna grab anything it touches in that selection, okay? So as long as I just even touch the slightest sliver, it's got that selected. So um, let's go ahead and break this person up. And I want to show you guys again, just if I select this way, I've only selected these areas right here. Whereas if I select, well, I guess these are kind of equivalent. It's hard to tell the difference really. Um, but it's the difference between selecting this way, not getting anything except those lines right there and selecting this way and getting everything right there. So that's why it's important to just kind of make a choice as to which direction you're selecting when you are selecting. All right, um, so let me just get rid of this now, and we'll start talking about lines. Oh, good. Speaking of some lines that are stuck. Okay. So the default tool in here um, is going to be the line tool. You can access that by hitting L on the keyboard. Um, it has a lot of similarities with the AutoCAD tool. So if I'm going to place a line right here to start building out a floor plan, I can just click right here on the origin. And then I can move out in that direction. And that's kind of hard to see, so I'm going um, this way. Now it's going to snap in the three polar directions it's got. So that's the red axis. That right there is the blue axis. And then right there is the green axis. So this will snap going off in that direction. This will snap going kind of in a vertical. And then this will snap going that way. And you can see that those three lines different um, line up with those cardinal, or cardinal directions right there. Uh, when you're drawing these lines, um, again, I kind of want, I always want to remind you guys, like, think about what the unit is or what the effective base measurement is in the program. So when we were working with Photoshop, we were talking about, um, you know, pixels. You're editing pixels on a sheet. When we moved to Illustrator, you were doing vectors. So you were doing lines um, on that sheet. Uh, when we got into AutoCAD, you were effectively just kind of doing a bunch of lines on there. And that's we have kind of a weird mix here in SketchUp where you're working with lines. So if I draw these lines down, you can see that they're, they're just there. But as soon as I cover this and I have at least a triangle, so I have um, three sides, that makes a polygon and it fills this space in, right? So now I have lines on the outside um, and you can see if I select them right here, just by holding down shift, it turns on the selection. I've got those three lines on the border, and then here in the middle is a face, all right? Um, everything in SketchUp that you will ever use is made up of a line or a face, okay? Um, in regards to faces, you can see that there's that face right there, but if I go under this, it looks a little bit darker. And I'll show you guys this tool in a minute, but I just want to make, make it clear that, like, I'm not doing any sort of weird light show or anything. Um... Let me flip this the other direction. So you can see right here, those are two different colored faces, right? And that's because I'm using this default material, which has a front, which is the lighter face, and the darker one, which is a, um, well, it's the back face. Um, eventually, some of you may get into 3D rendering, and you will have cases where things disappear, and it is because you applied colors, or materials in this case, um, to the back side of something, right? So typically, when you're building, before you start applying materials, um, you wanna make sure that you have all the lighter faces facing towards the outside. Um, and then just to, again, reiterate that, you know, SketchUp works on these polygons and having at least three field faces, 
these shapes should be parallel to each other. So if I fill this in right here, it should fill in there. If I draw this across, it should fill in there. And then if I draw this, it should fill across here. Um, something else I want to point out is, you see how I have slightly darker edges around the border? So that's SketchUp telling me that this is a terminal end visually, all right? That this shape ends here. Um, the reason why that's important is you can see that these interior um, lines that make up these faces, these ones are lighter. So that tells me that these are not the edge of something. So if you're working on something and you see a darker line where you should have a lighter line, and I don't know how to reproduce that because it's it basically happens by mistake, um, then you know you have an issue, all right? Also, often if you have a, a plane, a series of faces, and they're bisected by a line like this, you can often delete that line and continue working. So like right here, I know this face is like this, I can draw this line right there. If I draw the line from this corner to say right here on this face, see how those are dark? But as soon as I close this in, it's going to create its own face right there that's separate from these other faces. All right. Um, so there's a couple other things that I kind of glossed over as I'm working on things. So there is a fairly complex um, but subtle assistant, assistant tool in here. So like right here, if I hover over here, it's going to give me origin. So it's going to tell me you are on the origin of the project. That's your 0, 0, 0 coordinate. If I hover over here, it's going to tell me I'm on the green axis, red axis, and blue axis. Next, it's going to find midpoints for me. It's going to find endpoints. And it's going to tell me I'm just on an edge. Uh, similarly, if I'm on a face, it'll tell me that I'm on a face. And if I have multiple lines intersecting somewhere, it will tell me that there's an uh, well, in this case, it just forms an, another endpoint. So then I end up with a midpoint here. Um, SketchUp will also give you some assistance in terms of um, continuing a line. So if I just kind of move back here and then move out, you can see that it gives me an extend. So that's just continuing this line up through there. So there's a bunch of really subtle but quick and effective things that it has that allow you to work really quickly in here. All right, so um, that's the line tool. This is gonna be kind of your very most basic tool. Um, I think it's great to master it in this program, especially because I think that you can work a lot quicker in certain situations. Um, it's not the best tool for larger things, but sometimes if you have something that's broken and you need to go fix it, um, just pulling out the line tool works really well. So I use the line tool all the time for templating stuff out. Um, so there's good times and there's great times to use it, but not every time is great. We got race cars outside. All right. Um, so the next tool is going to be the arc tool right here. I don't use the arc tool too often. Um, I don't find myself drawing a whole bunch of arcs, but it is a fairly simple tool. Um, so, oh, actually, let me jump back here. Um, just like AutoCAD, you can start drawing a line in a direction. And then there's this little bar down here, and this is going to give you a lot of hints about stuff. So if I start drawing this line out, you can see that it's giving me a distance. So I can type a distance in there, like 10 feet. I can move it around to snap to the red axis, 10 feet. I can snap to the green axis over here and do 10 feet, and so on. So um, you can manually enter directions. You just have to make sure that this is positioned on the axis that you want it to go in before you apply that direction, all right? Um, so let's get rid of that. All right, so back to arcs. Um, again, just like, so just like with the line tool, um, we can start drawing the arc. Um, <clears throat> before you do that, just for now, recognize that it says sides 12 down here, and we'll address that later um, when we get to some of the other shapes. So um, drawing the arcs, we can click. We'll give it a red axis to go off of, and then we can set that distance right there that it creates the arc. Now, just like the line tool itself, this is basically just a line tool that auto-completes some spaces for us. Um, it does give us some nice hints about where the center is here. And like I was saying earlier, as soon as you create at least a triangle, a flat triangle right there, it will generate a face. But until that happens, I have nothing here except the arc, all right? You can come in here and just draw this across, and that will also fill it. So your faces don't have to be just like triangles, they can be entire regions of something. 
Um, and then you can, you know, bisect this, you can erase chunks from it, whatever it is you want to do. <clears throat> uh, um, but, and what we're going to really quickly see is that a lot of these tools only have certain uses. Um, you end up using a whole bunch of tools to do a whole bunch of different things in here. Um, there are different art tools. You can mess around with those, but I'm not going to go in depth with them. I typically just stick to the default A arc here, which is the two point. Um, three point is, I just find this one super difficult to use. So it's, it's kind of, I don't know. I've just never understood how to like really do that one accurately. So I just stick with the default uh, tool. This one is A. So then um, your next tool right here is going to be the rectangle. And I think that is an R unlike other programs that it is an M. Um, <clears throat> and so then just like with everything else in SketchUp, you click to place it and then space it out to the correct dimensions. You can type this um, and you can see that if I go kind of really long in one direction, you can see which way is left, which way is right, and which of those values comes before the comma. So if I wanted to go this way and I wanted 15 foot comma two foot, I can type that in and I have a 15 foot by two foot strip right there. Um, that's basically as deep as this tool goes. Um, typically, if I'm using the rectangle tool, it's because I have something like this that I just want to fill in really quickly. Um, something I haven't quite mentioned yet is that as I move around in here, you can see that um, right now, it's on this blue, like, see how the cursor has that little blue hint? Well, if I move this way, you can see that after a certain point, it turns to that green axis, right? So it's going to be perpendicular to the blue axis right here, perpendicular to green out here, and perpendicular to red out here. So if I start drawing this, it'll be a vertical wall in that direction. If I start drawing this, it'll be a vertical wall or rectangle, I guess, in that direction, whereas this is on the ground, right? Um... And then, just like everything else, it is just a series of small little lines that I can do whatever I want with. So you can mess with these, take chunks out, whatever it is. Alright. Uh, let's see. Circles, the next big one. Do a bunch of circles. Um, and this is where I want to highlight this little sides tag right here. So when you first open both the arc tool and the circle tool, you get the number of sides that generate it. So if I place this right here... You can see that there's different, like right here, I hover it, and it's an endpoint, midpoint, endpoint, midpoint. So there are 24 faces that go around this circle, right? Um, there's one there, and there, and there. Um, <clears throat> you don't always want to build geometry like that, and it this doesn't really become a problem for smaller projects, but um, especially when you're doing something the size of an office building, and then you're sending that off to a 3D rendering program, the less faces you have, the better. Um, let me throw together a little demo real quick. Okay, so I have two basic shapes that I built off of those two that I was showing you guys. Um, and so this one right here is my face with, um, what I did was shrunk this to 13 sides. And I probably could have gone even lower with 9. Um, um, but what this ends up being, um, is this one has 9 on it, this one has 24. Or sorry, this has 13 on it, this has 24. And from a distance, they visually don't look that different. So if you're working on something and you're sampling things that are of really low resolution, and it really doesn't matter what it is that they are, um, you can get away with just kind of keeping this really simple, right? Um, and again, it's something that really kind of comes into play when you're looking at um, much larger projects. Uh, the example that I've had in the past was, um, and I chose this shape specifically because of that, um, I had a chair that I downloaded off the uh, 3D warehouse, which again is something we'll get into later. Um, and it had wheels on the uh, thing, and it would, and it had something like, some, whoever had modeled it had increased it beyond this default, uh, again the default's 24. They had increased it to... Um... I forget it was a it was a high number over 32 or over 36 or something and then they used a follow me which ended up creating something like um you can see all these little squares that it's created um it created something like 
Oh, it must have, well, it's just 36 by 36, right? Because um, they would have used, well, they would have used the arc tool, so it would have been 36 by 18. Oops. So it would have been 648 faces on the wheel, um, and then each face in the rendering program got converted into two triangles, which means you had 12,000, or 1,200, basically 1,300 faces. Um, and then you had two wheels on each side of the caster, you had five wheels on each chair, and then I think I had something like 18 chairs in the building. So just because of that choice that someone made to bump that number of wheel faces up, I had a quarter of a million almost um, polygons in just drawing the, the wheels on the chairs in the project, right? Um, and so if I went, and I think I actually went in and changed it to a seven by seven, so I would have had seven by seven, and then two polygons each, two casters per chair, five casters, and 18 chairs. So that's barely over what I think the casters on one chair was for all the casters on all the chairs that I had. So it's one of those weird tangents I like to bring up now. None of you guys will remember it. I should probably just cut it from the video. Um, but it's something that will help your performance. Um, another example that I have is a student downloaded, or a classmate of mine downloaded a set of um, uh, dining ware, and it was a full plate setup. It had a four, uh, it had three or four forks, three or four knives, two spoons, teacups, cups, silver stemware, um, like three or four plates, and it was all like ridiculously high poly counts, right? And then whoever had modeled it had it was imported from something else, and it had. A ridiculous number of like surface offsets so you had surfaces inside of surfaces that were clear so that you could get a crystal reflection and it ended up like anytime she just moved the screen her mac would go into that little spinning rainbow thing for like five minutes and that's it that's all she could do and it took me the better part of an hour to go in and clean all that up just so that it would function again and it was just a case of because she had so many copies of that, her, it overloaded her computer. So again, SketchUp has its limits. Watch out for how many faces you put in things, because especially right here, as soon as I get to about there, you really can't tell a difference. And once I get to there, you can't tell a difference at all. Now, the other reason I was pulling this little tool out is because I wanted to do this. And if we crank that up, you can almost not tell from there too, right? So this thing is a nice tool for if you're just trying to keep stuff or smooth stuff visually, you can still get that shadow. The shadow isn't as nice, but it goes a long way to getting you kind of that same effect. So um, that's my rant on polygons, faces, and setting sides to circles. So let's get back to this. So we have 24 sides. Um, we'll be jumping into this tool next anyway, so it's nice to have a polygon out here, um, which is the push-pull tool. And so the push-pull tool is just going to extend a surface out. And so if I click on it, I can move this in and out, but I can only do so uh, perpendicular to that face. So if I go back to a weird, oh, let's just, just draw something on the ground right here. So if I draw this triangle here on the ground, I can also pull this out, right? But don't forget that this circle right here, even though I drew it with the circle tool and it looks smooth, I can come in here, crank this way down, Oh, um, and then I can change this so that I can see the faces on this and I can actually, because this is a smooth surface, I can pull this out. So you can do all kinds of weird things if you kind of understand how SketchUp's system works, where it, everything is basically just a bunch of faces and lines and anything that looks smooth is not actually smooth. It's just a bunch of faces that are like kind of pretending to be smooth. So if I do that, it now looks smooth again, even though I've got all these sticking out, right? So that's one of the things just I want you guys always to be aware in this program. If you want to do weird stuff, you just have to know that you can get in there and change some of those settings. Um, similarly, if I triple click on this, which is um, a different selection method, like um, you have your click, which will select whatever you click on. Um, It'll get the line if you click on a line, face if you click on a face. If you double click on a line, it's going to select that line and any face that's attached to it. If you double click on a face, it's going to select that face and any lines attached to it. Uh, beyond that, 
anything you triple click is going to select the entire thing. So you have three different clicking options as well as your left and your right selects. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So let me get this back down. Actually, let's just do that. Um, the next tool that we have is I'll just reference that. Okay. Um, so this is going to be the offset tool, and I don't think there's a, oh, it is F. Okay, yeah. So F is the offset tool that will select it. Um, when I start this tool, it's one of those ones where I like to select the surface that I'm going to be working with. And the reason why, let me just get a couple faces out here to show you guys why, is because if I'm working in a really tight space, let's pretend this is just something that's small. And I pull out the fault or the uh, offset tool and I start trying to do this and maybe like I'm trying to grab something here and I'm not quite sure what I'm grabbing. Um, then it's something that I really like to have as something that I can know absolutely for sure which face I have selected. So that's why anytime I use the fault or the offset tool, I'll select the face I want to use and then I'll turn the tool on. Right. So F and then I can select this. And what this does is it takes any lines that are connected to that face and it's going to give me a distance to offset them. So I can offset that one foot and you can see that it does that. Um, I can do it again and we'll do two feet and now it's out there. Um, and you can keep doing that however much you want. Now it's only going to offset from that plane. Um, so here's an example right here too where it's like, well, do I want to, which of these faces do I want to select? And it might be easier for me to come in, do that click and then do my offset from there. And continue going out. So uh, our next tool is going to be the move tool um, and the move tool is super handy. Um, again I like to select things before. Um, with the move tool you can only kind of just grab one thing at a time but if I use the move tool and get very specific things that I want I can um, move them um, ex all, all at once exactly as I want. Um, you can see right here that the move tool has me stuck on this plane right here, right? Um, so you can tell SketchUp, hey, I want to force things into a certain direction. So if you hit the up arrow, it's going to force this to go up. You can see that I'm kind of extruding this upwards with part of it still being there or down. If I hit the right arrow, it's going to switch me to red. If I hit the left arrow, it's going to switch me to green. Um, and then again, up arrow to blue. So I can, um, and then if you hit whichever one you're on again, it'll turn it off. So it'll get you back to the default behavior. Um, move tool is really handy, especially with all the stuff that you're going to be doing in here. Um, let me just move that up real quick. And so um, one thing that you might end up finding yourself doing a lot of in here is let's say you have a small column and you want a whole bunch of these columns. Well, you could sit there and kind of like move one at a time, or you can do what's called a move copy. Actually, and that's kind of what I was doing already, is you could copy it, paste it, paste it, and so on. But it wouldn't be kind of in a line, and it would take a while. So what SketchUp has is called the move copy tool. Let me get rid of these. So if I have this um, cylinder right here, triple click on it. So make sure that I get all the faces and everything that's attached to it. Hit M for the move tool, and then I can move this. And you see it goes off in that direction, but nothing fancy is happening. So tap the control key. Don't hold it down, just tap it, and it'll turn this. And you can see next to my cursor as I toggle this, you can see that I get a little plus sign that's right there. So that if I see that plus sign, I know that I'm doing a move copy. And then I can set my distance, and ooh, I'm kind of far out. Let me go smaller. So let's say this is a one foot cylinder. Let's say it's 10 feet high. And then if I triple click on this, we do the move, we do the copy, and then I can say, go out 10 feet. But if I want it to make a whole bunch of those, I'd have to do a whole bunch of actions. Or don't hit anything else. It still says 10 feet and I hit enter and I haven't done any other inputs. You can hit X and 12 and it'll move that out there and create um, 12 of those. All right, let me double check that's actually 12. And this entity info screen is super handy. Highly recommend you get used to using it. Um, 
um, especially because the square f the area that it can tell you very quickly is super handy. Um, 312 divided by uh, what's that? 4812. That's 24. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's super handy to be able to move copy stuff, um, especially some. Of, some of you may have seen some of the other classes doing like really complex patterns and things um, with the moved copy tool like doing something like this becomes fairly easy um, you can also redo your selection and then uh, what did I do for that let's do 24 feet and you continue doing this um, or you can continue doing this so if I actually wanted to do all these we'll copy them up 24 feet and then x5 and you now have a whole wall of whatever these cylinders. Well, actually, this is, I guess, a warehouse full of these cylinders. Um, so anyway, yeah, it the move copy, uh, the move tool is great, but the move copy is where it really shines. So it's one of those auxiliary things um, that once you kind of pick up, you have to get used to in your workflow. But at, once you do, it's great. All right, so let me clear all these out. Um, <clears throat> So rotate tools next, and this one is going to be just like the other one. Um, it's going to default to a certain face, but if I go out on the red axis, it's going to turn red. If I go out on the green axis, it's going to turn green. And if I go on a face of something, it's going to give me all these different faces. Um, and sometimes there'll be ones that are polar or will be perpendicular to the model itself. But in this case, I don't have any because it's an even number. Well, it's an even number divisible by four. So my edges are going to be fixed in a... Um, direction that is not what I'm looking for. So what you can do, again, just like with the move tool, is press the arrow keys and lock this into a direction, right? So if I do this selection, Q for rotate, and then right arrow key, and I can turn on the rotation and lock it into this axis, and then I can do my rotation. And then I can set whatever distance or whatever number of degrees I want down here. Um, and again, you don't have to go and select that and like this little box right here it just will accept input when i start typing so if i say something like 33 degrees it's going to tilt it at 33 degrees um, so it is pretty handy for that um, something else that i've seen a couple times is um, some of you guys will sometimes have a shape that is like just a little bit off like that um, and you want to get this down on a face so let's say that i just i spun this like that and then we did this and then we did that so now it's kind of offset in a couple different axes right um, but I can now take this place it on this surface oh snap to something will you uh, I think that's the bottom we'll see it uh, looks like that's the bottom. So I can snap this to this surface, and then I can lock it down on the green axis right here. So I'm assuming that this point is my bottom. And then I can use these relative points to snap it to different surfaces along here. And then I can, in a couple easy steps, just find out where this intersection is. Right there. And then, actually, that's not a good intersection. Let's do... That's not quite it, but follow this line up. And then snap this to blue. Come back around. Green face. Find... Yeah, see, the problem is there's too many faces on this one. This was a terrible thing to do an example with. Um, green axis right there. Actually, let's move this up so that I know that this is stuck on there. And now I can use the green axis on this and then snap that straight up. And I think I have... I think I've got it basically on. Anytime you see this right here, this little glitchy thing, um, this is SketchUp telling you that you have two faces that are directly on top of each other. Um, so if I was to take this surface, put it there, 
and then uh, let's reflect or mirror the faces. So now I have a light face on a dark face. You can see this whole thing glitchy. I'm sorry if you have seizures. Um, I did not mean to intend that. Um, but anytime you see this, you know that you have multiple faces that are in the same plane. Um, so try and correct those when you see them. So um, again, that's the rotate tool. It's pretty handy for if you have like a weird off kilter couch or something, or you need to rotate something to attach to a ceiling or a wall or whatever. Um, it's super great for that, but most often all you're going to be doing is just like rotating a couch 90 degrees. Like just, here's my couch, there it is. Um, but that's how you do it. Skill tool. Do not use a skill tool, please. Um, I know you're going to run into it. It's going to be super tempting. You're going to see that couch and that couch is going to be a foot and a half too wide for your, for your space you want to put it in. And so you're just going to squeeze that couch down. Um, and then it looks terrible. Or you got a door and your door was too wide and it had molding. So you tried to fit it in the same spot and you just shrunk it down. And what ends up happening is now your door is actually way too small for the opening because you shrunk it down based on the exteriors of the molding. So do not use the scale tool. Um, there, I can think of a few times where I've used it where it's actually been handy, and usually it's in shrinking the entire model down a specific percentage because a value was wrong somewhere or something. So uh, it's not super useful. Um, stay away from it. There are times when you should use it, but generally it's not going to be for the most of the purposes um, that anyone's going to be using it for. Um, there is this flip tool, which is kind of nice. Uh, let me get, actually, let me just draw a rectangle here. We'll pull this up. Um, and just to show you guys how some of these tools chain together, you can do stuff like that very quickly. Um, so if I want to flip this, we'll go to the flip tool. I don't think it has a, yeah, it doesn't have a key bind. And then you can just tell it, I want it to flip in this direction. Um, so this was a handy new ad. I forget when they added this, but um, it's in here now on my 23. I don't have 2024 20, right now. Um, but it is super handy for if you're just like, oh, my couch needs to do this. Flip tool, flip it that direction. Um, so highly recommend getting used to that one. Um, it's in both toolbars. Um, next is the tape measure. Um, there are two ways to use the tape measure. I guarantee you're all going to use it the way that is very frustrating. So. Um, let's say that you have something like this right here and you need to measure something. The right way, in my opinion, and I can be proven wrong, but I am not on this because I'm 100% sure this is the right way to use it. Well, not the right way. It's a way to use it. The other way these problems I'll show you. So you would take this face right here and then you would offset this um, tape measure line, whatever distance. Again, you can enter it so I can enter three feet. And now this will be a perpendicular line going off into forever that is three feet apart on that exact axis, right? What is going to happen is you guys are all going to click on a corner like this. You're going to go out three feet and you're going to go, hey, Michael, my line didn't show up. And then you're going to do it two or three more times. Oops. And then you're going to move your model and you're going to go, hey, what's this? What's this wacky little thing hanging out right here? And then you're going to try and select it on the line right here. And oh, I guess that does work now. Um, but it used to be the only way you could select these was by clicking on the little head of it. Um, so they were hard to remove um, because you had to click exactly on the head. I guess they're easier now to remove. Um, but it also doesn't place the thing you're doing. So whenever you're using this tape measure tool, unless your exact purpose is you need a point floating out in space, um, I want to point right here, three feet from there. I need that point to be exactly right there, and I don't need it to do anything else. Um, and you can chain a couple of these together. Um, but my point is, if if you're using those that way, that's fine. But typically what you guys are doing is you're going, I need something just like a six-inch run right here that I need to offset. And then following up with like a line tool or something, maybe a rectangle, whatever. Um, Really? What the hell happened there? 
Uh, all right, so draw that right there. So draws right there. That's kind of like most of the use case for the tape measure that I end up doing. Um, so when you end up, sometimes you'll basically like do all that stuff and then you'll have a bunch of those little ghost dots from these things hanging out inside of your model. That's what's causing it. That's why it happens. Um, don't use it like that. Um, unless your exact reason is to use it the way that you are using it. Uh, let's push this down, just do a fun shape right here. Okay, um, so next is the tool, it's a little bucket right here. This is the paint bucket. You can hit B to get to it. Um, we have a whole bunch of materials here in SketchUp. Um, if you click on the home, it shows you what's in the model. This right here is all stuff that was uh, part of that original character that was in here. Um, so right now it shows that I've got a little, like this little tick right here on the bottom right. If I go to components, click on the in model right here as well, there's the person. And you can see that all the colors that she is made of are here inside of this. So even that like pink right there, um, where's that salmon color right there? So I guess that's just her skin. Um, so all of these colors are here inside of this model. Something fun that you can do is if you select one of these, go to edit, you can just start kind of messing with that color. So I can change her socks without having to go in there. Um, where you run into issues is actually overwriting existing color names. So you can do this and make certain parts of your model super easily adjustable, but you have to be prepared to do it ahead of time. So let me delete her from here. Something else I want to show you guys is... Um, when you have on your components thing right here, we'll get into components in a minute. Um, but if I go to this little tab right here, choose purge unused. When I go back to my colors menu, you can see that that little white triangle has disappeared. That means that these are no longer used in my model and I can click this and I can do purge unused. Um, where is this being used? By what? Uh, anyway. Um, something that a lot of you will inevitably run into is, hey, Michael, my entire SketchUp is running super slow, and then I'll tell you, how big is your file? And you'll say, my file is 300 megabytes. Um, to this day, I think SketchUp still breaks down at about a file size of 60 to 80 megabytes, even with hardware being twice what it was when I was a student. Um, and that is simply because of the architecture that it's built on. And so what, what usually happens is you guys go to the warehouse, you download a couch, and the creator of that couch thought, I'll use a 17 megabyte JPEG file to do the textures on this couch. And the couch looks fantastic if you're zooming in on the couch like this. But from here, it looks like a normal couch. And from here, it looks like a couch. And from here, you can't even see that texture but it's still 17 megabytes in your file. Um, so it ends up, and it's, you know, it, that couch just put you a quarter of the limit towards the point where SketchUp starts slowing down. And then you're going, hey, my SketchUp file's really slow. So I'll go over the warehouse and how I would recommend you guys import things in a minute, but I just wanna kind of go over colors right now. So we have a couple different things right here um, because I've cleared out the in model. We don't have a lot to go with right now. And I still don't know why we have those here. Um, so we have a choice of materials right here. Um, this gives us a bunch of defaults. So we have, um, I don't know, not sure what the 3D printing ones are. We have asphalt. So if you want to put something down that kind of looks like asphalt, black top, old black top, um, polished concrete. So if you're doing countertops or something, um, you could easily just do like, uh, five, and then pull this down. Uh, obviously, I've got something to clean up here, but I could just very easily make a polished countertop like that. Obviously, I could round the edges on this too, um, but that's how you very quickly kind of get a surface working in SketchUp. Um, Scored concrete, I don't know how you'd want to use that, but there's different options you have. Anytime you place one of these again, it ends up in your model. So right now these are in the model and I can go purge the ones that I haven't used, but these have all been loaded in. 
Once it is loaded in your model, however, if you click on it, you can change this name. So if I wanted to call this kitchen countertop, it's always here. Um, all right, because I use it on the side there. So if I'm working through the model and then later someone says, hey, the kitchen countertop we're using in the renders, it's slightly darker than that, great. I can go to the edit option right here, drag that down, get it to match, and we're good to go. Um, something else is if the size of this pattern right here is too big or too small, you can adjust it with these. So if I want to turn this down to one foot, I can do that. If I want to change it to 10 foot, I can do that. Um, there are some interesting things you can do along in that process. Um, just be aware that you can do that. You can also upload your own texture images or you can export these um, out to a third party pro or well, just to another program. Um, and then you can edit them however you want. Um, another thing is colorize here. So if I check this, it's going to colorize that. Um, let's see. No, I forget what that is because this just changes the kind of the default background. Or not background, but like. I don't know what this color translation is called. Um, it just sort of overrides it. Um, some of these other options, not a huge fan of that color wheel, by the way. Um, I kind of like the HLS or HSB. Um, these get you basically a darker and then a lighter. Um, and then I think we've got oh, opacities right here. So why is that a 92? So you can make things transparent as well inside of SketchUp just with some of these controls. Um, and then, like I was saying, if I go back here, this model, the polished concrete, the original one I was using is still here. It's unmodified, unlike the one that I was messing around with. You also have the sample tool right here. So you can click on sample and it'll load that one up. And again, anytime you load it, it's already in your model. So it should be highlighted right here. Um, again, there's a whole bunch of different things in here. So you've got carpets. Um, so if I want to make a carpet, but I won't, but again, we're like, oh, well, it's a little lighter than that. It's a little browner than that. It's a little greener than that. Um, you've got those options here with these controls. So uh, those are colors, um, or rather materials. Um, and again, you do have several sections here. Um, you can usually get something nice out of everything except this and this. Um, but yeah, so that's materials and SketchUp. Um, let's get to the other tool I wanted to talk about, my favorite, which is the Follow Me tool. So. I have a really, what I think is a really simple way to draw doors. Let me get back here. So let's say I have a three foot wide door. So I'll just draw this right there, three feet. Um, I'm super far out, so I can do control. Uh, I always forget the key bind though. Control shift E, I did, oh, I was doing X, that's why, okay. Um, so there's that line that I drew for my door. So I've got a three foot wide door. My door is going to be six foot eight. So I'm going to go on the blue axis right here, six foot eight. And then I'm going to hold down shift. That's another option you have. So instead of just locking it in this direction, I can hold down shift. When I do that, you can see that line turns bold, just like if I go green or blue, or if I go green, it's going to get bold when I hold down shift and it's going to lock me into that axis, no matter what I'm doing. So I'll do red snap to there, close that, and now I have this face. So if I have a three foot wide opening on this door, then I can draw just a little frame around it. Um, and I typically try to do this uh, five, oops, so half an inch, half an inch, and then this will be six inches, 0.5, 0.5 and then one and back. So what does the follow me tool do? Cause that's what I'm actually here to show you guys. So if I just kind of move this, I'll do a copy, a move copy out here, select that, delete it, double click on this and move this. I want that right in the center there. The follow me tool will actually let me use this path of lines as a way to extrude this surface right here. So if I, and again, this is one where you want to select on the thing 
And then this is where it's handy for being able to see everything, is if you're here and you start the tool, I can't get up to the rest of the path. So if I'm out here, I can. And then um, it usually goes wrong the first try, and then it works fine the second try for no reason. So that right there gives me a path that it can follow to generate the face for this door. Um, typically when I do this, I would also not do it right there. Um, I would do a little jut out for part of the frame. And now I can have it follow me on that as well. Now you see something I'm double checking too is just that this has um, all the light faces. And you'll notice if I reverse the faces, you can see how much darker that is. So that's something that like you just kind of get used to watching for um, whenever you're working with SketchUp. So that's a really useful way that you can use the Follow Me tool. Um, I've seen a couple times where someone had like, again, you can use it with the Arc tool. So if I have an Arc right there, Arc right, oops, Arc right there, and then just make sure that whatever you're doing, it's perpendicular to the uh, thing. So if I do this, I'll just make a weird little like extrusion like this. What did I do? Oh, it's like, why is this not lining up? Okay. That's why it's not lining up, because it's wrong. Okay. So we'll do that right there. And then I just need on this, I need a reference point for what is 90 degrees, so I can do a rotation, move, copy, rotation, 90, and that gives me a way to position this so that it's perpendicular. Reference with a rotation to that line, make sure that snaps, and now I can do a follow me along this line, I'm getting a position where I can see the whole thing. And then we can just extrude that along that distance. And you get this fun little shape right there. So follow me is a really fun tool. Um, you can also do it with the circle tool. And this is how I like make lamps and or not lamps, but uh well, yeah. I mean I could do a I could do a lamp, I guess. Um so let's say that I have a, a uh, uh what is this, a radius? Let's do a three inch radius, six foot, so or six inch. Jeez numbers. All right. Um, so if I find out what the center is, I can draw a line up. That'll set my height. And then what I talk about whenever I'm doing this is a profile. This is the profile that I want my thing to have. So um, again, I'm making sure that this, the blue uh, diamond right here is here. Um, that's my, this is on face. So that's a tool hint I'm getting that's giving me that this is the correct thing. There's my on face right there. And then we'll just do a line from right there, straight up, and then another arc. And again, I'm working on, in this case, 12 sides for this arc. Um, would highly recommend, again, if it was something like just a simple base, um, I could shrink this down, especially this curve right here. I don't need 12 segments making this up. So I could switch this down to arc, do four segments, and then pull this up. And then um, when you see that little blue right there, that's saying that this is kind of a complementary curve, right? So right at that point, each of these angles is gonna have the same um, angle between, or each of these lines is gonna have the same angle between them. So it gives you a smooth curve appearance right there. Um, and then if I'm gonna make a tighter arc on here, um, or one that's more important, I'm gonna bump this up to something like maybe nine. So we'll do nine sides on this, and we'll just do an offset right there, and I'll let that just sit as it is. And then um, we'll do another arc, and then I can close this off over here. And once you see those lines go, you know that you have a closed surface inside of this. Now I can delete everything else here. Actually, let's draw another thing up to the top here. And then let's do, oh, just keep missing it. All right, um, let's do 
this. So this will be like a little lampshade. And then just to connect everything, I do need one little surface that connects all these. So I'll just get this right here. And then we can close this after we do this. So, and then I need to make sure that all of these are part of the same face. So if I click on this, this whole area right here can get highlighted. Um, oh, I hit K at some point. Okay, so that gives me this shape right here. And then I can use the follow me tool. And then again, it always messes up on the first try, but uh, yeah. Oh, I got it that time. So there you go. I have a, lamp, a really simple lamp. Um, I can push this down because it doesn't need to be that high up. It can be flush with that. And then I can push this middle piece down too and just get rid of that part that was holding that together. Or if I was feeling fancy, I could somehow turn that into a uh, lampshade hold, uh, support or whatever. But visually, I don't really need to do that. I can do that from over here just fine. Um, though it is a separate shape now. So um, anyway, that's how I create a lamp um, using that follow me tool. Um, OK, so we have a couple other things I want to talk about here. Um, components in the warehouse are kind of the last big thing that I want to talk about. Um, some of you guys were clever in using um, uh, block libraries, external block libraries for AutoCAD. I'm fine with that. I don't care. I just, as long as you develop the basic skills to use the tools, that's fine. Um, SketchUp's a bit of a different beast when it comes to building stuff because stuff just takes forever to build. So what SketchUp has is this 3D warehouse right here, and you guys should have this as part of your components panel right here. If you don't, um, you're going to go to window, default tray, and turn on components. And if you have some of these unchecked, that's probably fine. Um, most of these don't need to be checked most of the time, um, especially shadows, scenes, and inst an instructor. Because um, I'm your instructor. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I'm not jealous. All right. So, um, all right. So, uh, what you have in this 3D warehouse is you can search for models in here. So, if I type in table, it's going to do a little search. And then it's going to give me a table and I can just click on this table and I can drop that in there. Now, you remember what I was telling you guys about textures? This one's probably fine, right? Um, if I open up my materials tab, go to end model, you can see it looks like this one brought in wood cherry original. And I think that's just one of the standard. Um, yeah, wood cherry original. It's just one of the standard uh, SketchUp um, textures. But other ones, if I, and you can kind of see as I'm going down, like we can download an entire like lab, like an office building for some reason, someone has uploaded this to the warehouse. And so you can see, I just, hey, here's a, here's a thing. Um, so there's all kinds of weird stuff on SketchUp. So um, what you can do is you can go to the actual 3D warehouse. They have a website um and you can browse things through here so you can very quickly um because that little tiny window is horrible in sketchup um uh, you can there it is um, you can turn this so that it's showing you large thumbnails but like those aren't great either um so i find that the actual full-size warehouse is easier to manage and then if you want you can just click download sketchup file and then um, open it and it should, oh, it's opening up in a whole new SketchUp window, um, which is probably for the best anyway. Um, so there's my whole new SketchUp window with that sink in there. And presumably it's built to scale and everything. Um, and you can see that someone did a lot of nice work on there. It's super shiny. Um, let's see what they have for materials. Yeah, so they've got fairly minimal materials, but you can see that here, I've still got two materials. So if I now take this, copy that and paste it into my working test little model that I had here. It's now here. And then those materials, well, you see how many materials I already have in here? And I've only imported what, like three things? Well, I imported that whole office, so that didn't help. Um, so as you're working through your project, something that I highly recommend you guys do is occasionally, once you've kind of reached a stopping point where you're like, okay, this, this area is settled, go to in model, Go to the little arrow here, 
Uh, oh, you guys probably can't see that. It's probably right outside the record frame. Um, click on this little tab, purge unused. All right. So you just purge all the things that you don't need anymore and then come to your materials tab and then purge unused right here. And you can see I'm now down back to five materials. So kind of end of the day, end of the session, when you reach a milestone or something, make sure you guys go in and you purge your unused components and materials because otherwise your program will get quite bloat or your file will get quite bloated um, and start taking forever to save. It'll be difficult to move around. Um, so anyway, we're at an hour. I want to keep it just at an hour. So um, that's the warehouse. There's tons of stuff on there. Um, your boy, me himself, uh, for several, these are my bragging rights, so I have to brag. Um, oh, it's not hard to find anymore. Um, I, for a short period of about a year and a half, I had the most popular toilet on SketchUp, and it was one of the most popular models in SketchUp, um, only because there weren't very many SketchUp models, but, uh, oh, I don't see it anymore. But anyway, um, let me see if I can find it. Okay, I found it. So, unfortunately, they don't have the download counts anymore, but it was somewhere in the high hundred thousands, if not low millions, um, if only because it was one of the earliest, um, toilets that was on SketchUp, and anytime you logged into SketchUp, you saw my toilet in the top 10 for about a year and a half, which was fun. Um, yeah, March 2014, so hey, <laughs> 10 years. Um, so anyway, again, polygon count, fairly low, something that I like to make sure I do in all my models. Um, but anyway, so SketchUp Warehouse is all yours. Um, you can find all kinds of weird stuff on here. Um, you can find whole, whole dining tables, you can find couches, you can find beds. So use this as a resource. I do not expect you guys to build like a bed that looks like that. On the other hand, here's your polygon count too. This is a quarter million polygons. Again, it's better than having a couple wheels on chairs um, take that many, but also just keep that in mind as you're working on the project. Also check the file size. So this bed has a bunch of big textures on it. 49 megabytes, 21 megabytes. Um, you probably don't need to use those if they're that high. You can just do something else. Um, if I was to download this one, let me drop this in SketchUp. Okay, so here it is in SketchUp now. I've got this set up. If I go in here to um, the materials, click on in model, and you can see like I've got a magazine texture, right? I don't need a magazine texture, so you can just delete the texture from there. Um, there's these leaves. So apparently this plant has a whole bunch of textures in it that are taking up a bunch of memory and things. So I can delete the plants if I want to, or I can just go in um, and replace them with a green color. So if I just edit this, uncheck use texture image, and realistically, no one's going to notice that unless they're zooming in on your plant leaves for some reason. So I can just remove these textures. My dog is judging me, I'm sorry. Sigh louder over there, won't you? Okay, um, whatever this material is, so probably the stripes for the bed. Um, let's say you don't even want stripes on the bed. You just want a solid color. And that's not even the right stripes. Who knows what stripes I just changed. Let's try this one too. Get rid of that. So I can do that right there. And then if I was to save this, let me see what it actually turns Okay, so I've got that in here, and now, um, so, did that, now we need to purge our materials, so in model, um, uh, no, because it still says it's, um, right here, so here's the original, it's at 22 megabytes, I'm now at 19 megabytes, so it's actually still got something in here that's crazy large, um, let's go ahead and delete that. What is this? It's going to be something weird too. It's never like a normal thing. 
Well, unless there's just, it could just be that there's so many polygons in here. Um, though that would be incredible. But you can see we're going pretty deep in, and there's a bunch of polygons on this bed, so. Um, still double clicking in here. We'll go over polygon, or uh, yeah, so there's right there, you can see all the polygons that make up this bed. We go to entity info right here, it's 15,825 entities. So it's a fairly complex bed spread. It looks nice, um, but let's say we just delete it. Uh, who knows what's actually causing that. Oh, no. And you can modify, obviously, <laughs> You can modify these components the way I am. So if there's something in there that you don't like, you want to change the color, you just you want to change its position. It's so like, let's say I want this higher up, or actually lower on the bed, right? I want it down here somewhere. Just move it down there. You don't have to worry about it. They're not going to come after you. Um, or you can just delete it. And let's say, I don't need that anymore. Save it. Let's see if that's what caused... Oh my... No, oh wait. Oops. I know what I did. <laughs> Now I'm stuck with this. Okay. Uh, let me resave this. Yes. I'm trying to figure out what's causing all the file size in this. It could be those pillows. Who knows? Um, we're down to 17 megabytes. So yeah, this is still whatever this is. This is just a large bed. Um, you could get away with a couple of these in your model. But um, as soon as you get to like four or five of these, um, I have a pretty beefy gaming rig that I'm recording this on. Um, so let's see what happens when I, yeah, you can see it's moving slow just from the move copy right here. Um, so if I do that, X5, and then that, come on, <laughs> yeah, grinding to a halt. Uh... Yeah, it, okay, there it goes. It's going, it's going. No, it's not, okay. So, okay, so this is why you, you guys wanna make sure, because the school computers are not as powerful as this computer, and this computer's struggling at six beds. Well, 12, I guess, if you include the copy. Um, something else that doesn't help your performance, just as a last tip on the way out, is make sure you don't turn shadows on unless you absolutely need them. Um, okay, so those were off. I guess that was just a glitch I was seeing earlier. Um, when you turn shadows on, it's going to calculate the sun position and a bunch of other stuff, and all this becomes that much harder to move as you go through the thing. Um, but we'll cover some of these other things in the uh, class two on SketchUp, and then uh, we'll get started on the project, I think, next week, or a milestone next week.